Uh, sorry, the word of God to Daniel, chapter 3, verses 24 to 30. The scripture passage this morning is from Daniel, chapter 3, verses 24 to 30. Let's read responsively from this word of God. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 24. Then... King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did, you, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. We will read together. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. Um, trust that we all had a good week and busy week, productive week before the Lord. Um, I had a good week too, and uh, I had the blessing of meeting an old friend this past week. Uh, he uh, was, he is a uh, pastor friend from like 20 years back and uh, was able to meet his uh, beautiful wife and two teenage kids. Uh, but I was a little bit surprised because last time I saw him, was a, he was a pastor, uh, English ministry pastor. But now he was a missionary uh, to this country working with the International Mission Board. And I get to hear a little bit about um, their situation, the mission field situation. Um, they were at this country where I thought there was, you know, apparently religious freedom and they could worship God and have any, choose any uh, religion they wanted. Uh, but, so there's no problem with you entering the country, that country, as a tourist or for your business. And many of you actually visit that place for business. Uh, but once they know that you're a Christian, they raise a red flag and uh, they become suspicious of you. So um, my friend who is a missionary and his wife, they cannot say that we're going there. To, they're going there to share the gospel. So when they're asked what is the reason for the, the entry into this country, they told me that they say, you know, we're here to meditate because there are many mountains, very mountainous country. And they say, we are very religious and we enjoy your mountains and we're here to meditate. But then the uh, immigration officer uh, is not really believing. It's not, they're not very credible. So they turn to the kids and ask them, so why are your parents really coming into our country? I was shocked a little bit to hear that, uh, you know, they would even ask their kids um, this question and try to probe what, the reason that they were coming to the country. I thought it was actually uh, this despicable. You're asking the kids for uh, the motive and they're very, you know, uh, adamant of finding out if you're a Christian or not. 
we find in many parts of the world that uh, there is persecution in various at various levels. Although many countries claim they have religious freedom, but uh, if you are not uh, don't follow the religion of the land, if you're not with the majority, in fact, you are not welcome. In communist area countries, in Muslim countries, and uh, many limited access countries, we find this prevalently in the world. We hear of persecution, and sometimes we hear of people even, you know, um, being murdered because of their faith in Jesus Christ. As people who live in the United States, we don't go through this kind of uh, trials or persecution. But the persecutor, uh, the one who goes against God, who is Satan, who is at work in the world persecuting Christians, the same Satan is also alive and well in our midst every day trying to push us, trying to persecute us, and separate us from the love of God. Because in times of need and difficulties, he, the accuser, might come to you and me and say, did God really put you in this situation? Is God really good for good that he is putting you through this? That you have to go through this uh, uh, uncertainty and unfairness and all the suffering in the world. If there is a good God, how can this happen? The goal of the enemy is to uh, put a wedge, put a wedge of doubt between us and God. And, and the enemy has been doing this for since the beginning of our humanity the first ancestors of, of Adam and Eve. We also remember the story of Job, how he was tested by the enemy. And uh, he continues, the enemy continues to do this, even to us who live here in this land where we claim to have religious freedom, always continues to attack us to doubt the love of God. But if you think about it, the Bible already predicted that these trials are not uh, just random things. It is actually a normal part of our daily lives. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Jesus' uh, disciple Peter writes in his letter, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though not something strange were happening to you. It's nothing strange. Every day we are tempted by the tempter. We are accused by the accuser and try to deviate, uh, uh, divide us from God's love. If this is a normal part of our lives, shouldn't we know how to cope with this? Shouldn't we know how to deal with the fiery trials in our lives? Although we're not in the mission field or in a you know, persecuted, physically persecuted area, we truly are spiritually always persecuted by the devil, uh, tempting us to sin or tempting us to doubt the love and the grace of God. My message this morning is raising this question. How can we endure fiery trials in our lives, in our faith? How can we endure the fiery trials of the enemy? And as last week, it is a wonderful story of what God has done among his people. Remember that last week, Daniel and his three friends were taken captive to Babylon, the capital city of Babylon, and they uh, were given, they were, the, the culture of Babylon was forced upon them. They were given new names. They were persecuted. But because of their spiritual identity, their holy identity, they were able to stand up. They were able to um, give godly wisdom in a place where it was ungodly. But the enemy is not somebody to stop there and say, I give up. The enemy actually notches it up a little bit, a, a, a whole lot, to attack the men of God, the holy people of God. They are being tested to see if their truth, their identity in God is authentic, if they truly are holy people of God. They are, again, once again, tested by the evil one. As we go into the story, we find the King Nebuchadnezzar, the monarch, the, the strong ruler, the cruel, uh, iron, cl iron class leader. He did something despicable, something that is the most arrogant thing a tyrant could do, which is set up a golden image, this golden statue, and make people bow before it. Because it is a way of submitting everybody under his, the king's rule. And his arrogance was up to the sky in order to make this big stat golden statue. And he said, whenever there's music, religious music coming, playing, everybody must bow down to my image, the image that I have made, this God, golden God that I have 
created. And uh, in the Bible, it says it's about 90 feet. So if we think about maybe from here to there, 45 feet, maybe 50 feet, it's like twice the size, uh, height of this, the ceiling. So it was pretty big. It was pr pretty overwhelming if you saw it in person, I believe. Could you imagine what it would like? It would have been like when there's music playing and you're all forced to, we're all forced to bow down before this idol. It got me thinking and, and remembering an uh, a, a, a experience I had. I was uh, traveling to another country with some of our brothers. Uh, it was a dominantly Muslim country, and uh, we were doing you know, gospel work and serving God's church there with missionaries. And uh, it was the period of Ramadan, right? The time of praying for the Muslims. And so we did our ministry for an entire week, and it became Friday. So it was Ramadan, and it was Friday. So the missionary told us, you know, it's going to get pretty crazy as the prayer time comes on Friday evening. So we must rush and finish our ministry before it's too late. Because what happens is, when the sound, when the call for prayer comes from the minaret, from the mosque, Muslim mosque, everybody will all of a sudden just uh, uh, get down on their knees and start praying to Allah. And when that happens, because the whole city does this, we'll be stuck in the central city. We have to exit out. We have to eva evacuate before that happens because all traffic will be stopped. Everybody will be on the street lying down and, and uh, bowing. So we have to get our cars out. We were doing ministry so you know, fervently with, with the last breath, with all effort. And guess what? We stayed a little bit too late. And, uh, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, uh, we could find people all over, you know, getting out in the streets and getting, getting mat, prayer mats out, and they're ready to do their thing. So I remember rushing out to uh, the car that was outside and just running, and, and we dashed out from that scene as, as fast as we can, be careful not to hit anybody. Uh, but I, I thought, what, what? this is not life for people living here. This is life for Christians who are living here. Imagine you're living in a Muslim country and you're a Christian, and everybody is bowing to a false god, and you stand out if you don't get out of there. People will notice you. You will be persecuted, if not by the government, by the people around you. you. Maybe it was like that for these three friends of Daniel. They were uh, now officials. They were governors under Nebuchadnezzar. The previous chapter talks about how God exalted them to be rulers and leaders of this country. So they were favored by Nebuchadnezzar, yet because they were favored, these Jewish boys were favored by the king, and Daniel was favored by God. There was jealousy probably around people, around uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And sure enough, they uh, they pointed out that these three men, leaders of their, of their local government, were not bowing down to the God, the golden God that you have created, the Kneezer. And so they were caught red-handed, not worshiping this idol. And so imagine they are being dragged, uh, they, were, they are chained, uh, and they're taken to the presence of the king. And in their hearts, they're so afraid. They know how, how ruthless this king can be. When they face the king, Nebuchadnezzar, but they are surprised. They are even a little bit relieved to find that he is not so hard upon them. In fact, he even made it, maybe they saw a glimpse of his smile too on his face because they found Nebuchadnezzar trying to appease them, trying to persuade them. Oh, you three men, uh, maybe you made a mistake. I want to give you another chance. If you, even just now, if you will bow down to this idol, this worship, this image that I have made, you'll be okay. Let's say nothing has happened. If not, but if you refuse to do that, the only other uh, road is that you will uh, fall into the fiery furnace, fiery, uh, this burning furnace, and you will be destroyed. And uh, he also threatens them in verse 15. Can we read verse 15 together? Do we have it on the screen? So 3 verse 15, ready to go. 
Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, or fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? And his word seems to be very convincing. Who? There's nobody that will be on their side. And there's, where's any God that can deliver these three men from the immediate threat of this king if they were not to worship this idol? What would you have done in such a dangerous situation? It seems that all they had to do was cut some corners, make some compromise. They could have talked to them among themselves and saying, you know, this Nebuchadnezzar is going so far to really accommodate us and he's very generous to us and he's made us leaders of, our, of these local governments and you know, we have really been favored by him. How about we just you know, pretend and just say, just to save his face, let us pretend and bow with our just you know, posture, but in our heart we can still worship God. We can cut some corners and satisfy everybody else. It's okay, everybody's doing it. They could have said that, and maybe that was the logical, maybe the wise thing to do at this time. But we find in 17 and verse 18, 17 and 18, that they made this uh, tremendous, amazing, this nonsensical confession. This is what they say. Oh, God is able to save us from this fiery furnace and from you, they say. But if not, even if he does not, we will not worship and serve your idol. Your God. They made this ridiculous, this uh, unbelievable statement boldly before Nebuchadnezzar. Now we want to ask the same question. You know, with this question, how were they so bold? Did ever God, God ever promise them that I will save you from this burning fiery furnace? As far as we can tell, there was no promise of God. But they were making this claim. And they had this, this faith, I guess. And um, maybe it was a, 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 a faith, baseless faith. As, they, as uh, Nebuchadnezzar heard this, this bold statement by these young men, you know, who don't know better, he was, his face became stone cold. And he became furious and angry. And it was so rushed, this, it, it, he was so enraged and angry that he commanded the furnace to be turned up to max max heatness, and, and put them in. The Bible says seven times hotter than usual, but they didn't have a measure, way to measure the heat. So it's a way of saying, exaggerating. You know, they made it as hot as possible, and he threw them in. He had the servants throw the three men into the furnace. And so uh, if you kind of think about those days, we don't know exactly what the furnace would have looked like, but we can imagine because it was such a hot, you know, fiery uh, place. It was probably built on the side of a hill or a mountain, and uh, it was kind of built around that mountain and the hill, and there would have been a uh, opening in the, at the top of the furnace. And there also would have been an, an opening or window on the side of the furnace. So you can imagine three, the three men were pushed into the fiery furnace from above, and the people outside could see from the side what was happening inside. Before we continue on this dramatic story, I want to ask the, the question once again. Um, this question, how were they able to endure the fiery trial in their life? For them, it was not just a metaphorical fiery trial. It was really a fiery trial. They were about to be burnt to death. How were the three people, the men of God, holy people of God, were they able to withstand this fiery trial? And the answer is this. They were able to make the confession of faith in their Lord. The power was in the confession of their faith. Can we say it together? Confess your faith in God's sovereignty. I know it feels kind of like a classroom at this point. Uh, can we just, in faith, can we say it together? Confess your faith in God's sovereignty. What's confessing? Confessing is saying the same thing. That's what it literally means in the Greek. 
this is Hebrew, but in the Greek New Testament. Confess means that saying the same thing. Homo logeo. Homo means same. Logeo means to say, speak. Speak the same thing. As we speak, what we believe is the word of God. As we remember what God has already give, told us, who he is, what he has done. As we say the same thing, there is power in that confession, that short confession of our faith in the sovereignty of God. That's what gave them the power to withstand a fiery furnace. They were saying, oh God, my God is the Redeemer. My God lives. These were truth statements that they lived by every day. We know that God will save us. He's been doing this all this time, and God is good all the time. It is saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It was a confession of their faith. This small statement were confession of of faith. And when they confess this, their, their acknowledgement of who God is and what he has done, it's like shining a, a beam of flashlight, a flashlight going out in the darkness, and suddenly there is strength. There is suddenly there is courage that was that was not there before. They were in a place where all they had to do was make some compromises and, and uh, humanly, you know, uh, speech, and they would have uh, been okay, they think, um, in the physically, but they confessed their faith. They could not but confess their faith in God. And this is what gave them supernatural strength to endure the fiery trials in their lives. You know, uh, I try to do visitations like once or twice, some, some weeks tw tw twice or three times, try to visit as many people as possible with, within the time. And uh, what do I do when I visit people? You know, do we just chat and have coffee and just talk about life? How are you? We do that too. But there's one thing it makes a visitation a visitation. It is, I try to remind everybody, remind us, myself and them, that what God has said for us. Just reminding what God, who God is and what he has done in our lives. There are people who are suffering in, um, you know, tremendous uh, fiery trials. There are people who see no answer, no exit out in their uh, situation. But when they hear the word of God, when they hear who God is once again, it gives them strength. It blesses me to see them being, uh, being in encouraged and strengthened as they hear, as they say, Amen to who God really is. When we have worship together, it is a reminder of who he is, that he is good. He is still our Lord and shepherd. When we are in fiery trials, we all need an encouragement from somebody, a visitation from a spiritual person, and reminding of us of who God is and what he has done. The three friends of Daniel were reminding themselves, each other, that who God is my God is a redeemer. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. This is the saying of, of David, King David. He did not say this, this confession of faith when he, everything was okay. He was in the cave, Adullam. He was being chased by the enemy, Saul, and the whole army was after him. But he was confessing in faith that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want even right now. And he blesses me in the face of my enemies. A table, if you will, a feast. And goodness and mercy will sh shall follow me all the days of my life. Because he is my shepherd. This was a confession statement. It was a, a statement confessing who Jesus, uh, who, who he uh, believed that God was. Brothers and sisters, in our fiery trials, let us confess our faith in Christ. Amen. We, we can learn from our ancestors of faith in the uh, medieval time and our reformers. They used to do these uh, breath prayers. God, you are good. Hallelujah. We praise you. Something like you say in one breath, in, in one uh, sentence. You want to exalt him, saying, God, God, you are still alive. Jesus, you are my redeemer. My God still lives. You will sa save us. All these statements, all these confessions can give us the strength to live each day in our fiery trials. In fiery trials, let us confess this truth statements, who he is. And the truth shall set you free. The words of Jesus. Going back to the story, 
Nebuchadnezzar, in his wrath, in his rage, he pushed these three people into the fiery furnace. But what happened next was unbelievable, right? He was watching from the side of the furnace, and he witnesses for us. We don't have YouTube here. We don't have a picture. Bible doesn't have a picture. So we only have to rely upon his eyes and the eyes of his officials. And they saw, uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw a fourth person in the fire furnace. He asked the other person, he asked his officials, didn't we put three men in there? Why do I see a fourth one? And they're all walking around. What's going on? And the fourth one looks like a son of God. He looks like a divine being. What's going on? And so Nebuchadnezzar has to call them out. Oh, come out, servants of the Most High God, Almighty God. His his sentence changes. He says, servants of the mighty God, almighty God. He recognizes that there is something divine happening here. There is a divine intervention here. And so he wants to confirm what has happened, and they come out from the furnace. And uh, the Bible witnesses for us, again, who, uh, what has happened to them. And this is not Nebuchadnezzar. It was uh, the satraps. It was the officials. And it was the uh, king's counselors. They all witnessed together that, you know, there, there was no singe, whatever. There was, their hair was okay. There was even no smell of any burning on them whatsoever. And now the table has turned. And Nebuchadnezzar says, Worship God, Almighty God of uh, the King, the God of um, uh, the three, the three, the, the three men, and uh, let their God be exalted. And he praises him, and everything else changes after that. And they truly were saved through this experience. What has happened? What has given them the faith, the faith and the strength to lead on in this fiery trial? And what has really saved them? The second principle we want to get out from this story is that we can endure the fiery trials as we experience God's presence in fiery trials. As we experience God's presence in fiery trials, we can endure. Can we say this one together? Experience, experience God's presence in fiery trials. And I pray with all my heart that all of us will experience His presence presence, his being with us in our times of trial, even fiery trial. We find this happening over and over again, not only here in Daniel, but throughout the Bible. And another person that I want to mention from the New Testament is none other than Paul, the Apostle Paul. Remember, Apostle Paul was preaching and sharing Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, saying that he is the resurrected Son of God, he is the Messiah. And because he was doing this, he got caught and he was in chains. He was dragged to Rome. He was on the way to Rome. He was put on this ship, right, with all the other prisoners, all the other criminals. He was being taken to Rome to testify and to be trialed and to be testified and to put in jail, maybe to, mur to be murdered. On the way, you know, they meet this huge, um, you know, this, this storm. And it, it lasts for many days, it says, the Bible says. And uh, you couldn't see the, the, the sun for many days. They were probably, uh, you know, seasick. Uh, they were throwing up, and they were exhausted. They couldn't eat anything. They just lost hope. Imagine Paul. You know, we think Paul, this great missionary, this great man of God, he never loses hope in God. But he probably was downcast. He probably was disappointed. What is my life Going, where is it going? Am I just going to die here in the Mediterranean Sea with all these other criminals? All I've done is preach the gospel, do God's work. Why am I here? How do I know this? You know, when I was in the uh, army, Korean army, rock army, I was, uh, you know, we went to the, uh, you know, boot camp, and after the, afterwards, we're sent to all the our our, our bases, you know, respectively, where, where, where we go. But we didn't know where we placed, and so what happens is, I would we would take this big boat, this ship. Don't think like a cruise ship, like you have coffee and just watch the scenery. Um, this was a you know ship, and you're put in the bottom of the ship, and there are like windows on the top, but you can't see really outside, but you can see the trees and the mountains go by. And I thought to myself, I, just last month, I was in the United States studying. I was you know, enjoying freedom, and now I feel like I'm the bottom of this ship, and I'm sitting with all these other strangers, and uh, I'm being told what to do. I'm being taken to somewhere I don't know where I'm going. I feel like a slave. 
I felt like, what's happening to my life? I'm at the bottom of my life. It felt really terrible. I felt like subhuman, really. Maybe Paul was discouraged in this point of life, his life. This ship, is, there's a shipwreck, and they don't know, maybe uh, the, the, their, their lives will be lost. And after many days, everybody was discouraged, and they were just lost hope. But all of a sudden, I don't know where this came from, but Paul stands up. He stands up and says, Gentlemen, do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. We will all live, all 200-something of us, we will all live and we'll make it to Rome. Maybe he was ridiculed. But Paul gives them, explains to them the strength of his confession. He says, last night, Jesus told me, my Lord spoke to me that you, Paul, will stand before Caesar and testify about me. And I believe, my Lord, and we will make it together. Uh, but we will be shipwrecked, but we will make it to land. And all of us, none of us will lose our lives. And he was able to even encourage them in not the fiery trial, but the wire, uh, watery trials. He was able to encourage them. What gave Paul to stand up in a trial like that, a period of trial like that? He had the encounter. He had the experience of encountering his Lord. His Lord said, you will be okay. When Jesus told him, you will stand before Caesar, it gave Paul superhuman strength and hope and faith to face this trial that was so imminent. I also want to share a, a small testimony, and so, some of you know this story already, of what happened to me last fall. Um, it's not a fiery trial, and I pray to God I would never have to go through what they had to. Um, but uh, maybe God will give me the strength to do what they did as well. But anyway, it's not something like that. But uh, as some of you know that there is a, a pastor's meeting in this area, Northern California, Korean Pastors Council. There's about 50-something churches, pastors meeting regularly each month. Uh, and I usually don't go there too much because... Uh, there are reasons, but I went uh, in one of their, their annual gatherings, and uh, somebody recommended me to be the general secretary for this year. And this is not a, like an honorable, you, everybody covets and want to be. This is something that nobody wants to do, because you're going to serve the other pastors and churches. You're going to be the communicators, sending emails, and planning events, and I, I knew that. And uh, it really disturbed me a lot. But being Asian and you know being a young man and with all these elderly <laughs> pastors how can I say no 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 not me because everybody else was uh, you know in ministry as well and then you know my heart was dis uh, displeased and I was a little bit distraught I came back home and I, I prayed to God why me God why now I don't want to do this I'm busy too God you know, you know all the people that I have to serve and, and love and visit, and I don't have time for other churches and pastors. Why me? Why, 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 why? You know what? When you pray like that, God usually changes you, not the situation. And that's what happened. You know, God, in my prayer time, I experienced him saying that, Joseph, can you serve my shepherds? Can you serve my shepherds? And really opened my eyes to see that those men and women were God's shepherd serving this community who have, some of them have dedicated their whole life to serving a congregation. They've given all to uh, serve the Lord. And Jesus was telling me, can you serve my shepherds for a year? And when I heard that, when I realized what Jesus was inviting me to, that changed my whole perspective. I could see that this was not just somebody, I know who that person is, who recommended me. <laughs> it's not just them recommending me, but it was Jesus who wants me to serve for a year, this people. And when that happened, my, all the complaint from my lips, it, it fell to the ground. And I, was, I had a different heart to serve them and to do my very best, not for them, but for you, Lord, because you have called me. An encounter, an experience with our God makes all the difference, even in fiery trials. There was no fiery trial for me, but even in difficult times of life, the more we, we need his presence the more when we are in the fiery trial. We need this fiery encounter with God in order to cope with the fiery trials that come in our lives. There are times when we have to do things that we don't want to. 
Maybe you are called to serve at, at the church, something that you've never done before. Maybe you see the circumstances and you're the one to serve this. And you might be complaining, you know, I'm busy. I have so many things going in my life, my kids, my family, my job, my work. But when God speaks to you directly, when Jesus speaks to you and says, can you serve my bride? Can you feed my sheep? That makes all the difference. Brothers and sisters, let us listen to the voice of your God every day. In fiery trials, we need a fiery encounter with our Lord. And we must remember that after, at the end of the tunnel of the fiery trial, there will be an end. There always is an end to this trial. At the end of the trial, the fruit is so sweet. So look at the lives of uh, the three people here. Uh, they were exalted and in a place where it was godless. Even though the Kinesi had to acknowledge that there is a God, and your God is the only God, let everybody worship this God. And you and I, we will be honored, we'll be glorified after as we go through the fiery trial that God has set before us. So I cannot emphasize enough the importance of your quiet time. As you one-on-one -on -one meet with your God, your Father, and your Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of worship as we try to listen and have an encounter with our Lord. And we, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of our Lord himself who can make all the difference in our fiery trials because he is with us and he will save. He is your shepherd and our Lord. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer.